<laughs> uh, I'm going to be talking about pixels versus points. Uh, cast your minds back to 2001, uh, a while ago now. Um, the majority of the images on the web were bitmaps. <laughs> What's a bitmap? There we go. <laughs> it is a digital image. It's composed of a matrix of squares. One square equals one pixel. And here we have a 10 by 10 uh, map. And a bit would be controlling each one of those things. I would say. Uh, so we would say, I want that one to be black, top left hand corner. So that pixel needs to be told by the file that that's its colour. Unfortunately, it also needs to tell it. It's all those, you can't read that. All those other ones say white, because uh, it's not enough in a bitmap just to say what one pixel is. You've got to say where everything is. Um, that's not much, that much of a problem on something that's 10 by 10. Um, it's still quite a lot of information, but um, it's not too bad. But if you start getting your images bigger, then you can imagine that's got a lot of information to, to convey to the browser or to whatever you're looking through. There's actually 9,800 pixels in there, so that's 9,000, at the very least, 9,800 bits of information within that. Um, so I have a pop quiz, audience participation, everyone loves these and this sort of thing. Who can name a bitmap type image file extension? JPEG. JPEG, good. BMP? PNG. PNG, yes. TIF. TIFF, yes. Target. No, Target is, well, Target is an old, is an old one, but it's been, yeah, it's been sacked off. Vicar. <laughs> Vicar is one, thank you, Darren. Uh, these, are, these are most of the file types that you would, you would see uh, with bitmap images. My favourites being Fliff, uh, Pam, Sid, and indeed Vicar. I don't know what Vicar is, by the way. Uh, this is Wikipedia. But these are all in deep. <laughs> uh, so, because there's a lot of information within a bitmap image, um, all those different file types uh, like encode though, that information in different ways. Lossy compression is one of those ways, and JPEG uses it, but a lot of them others, others do. Um, lossy compression this is an example of it. So, what the, the file does, as it encodes the image, it says, well, these colors are quite similar, so we'll, we'll put the bits as the same. The problem with that is, um, because it's lossy, every time you save that file off, uh, what it does is it loses more and more information. So you'd start off, I mean, the apple on the left is, has already been compressed, um, but if you were to keep, keep saving that, if you change the file size or change the, the, the physical dimensions of that thing, then you would start losing more and more uh, file uh, fidelity, and you start getting artifacts, which, which is the, the thing around the top of the cut section where uh, it said, well, this white's kind of like this, this sort of, light green, uh, and so this is probably part of the file, because obviously the, the, the encoding engine doesn't know what the thing is, all it's doing is, is matching the colours and saying, well, that's fine. Another one is interlacing. So you've probably seen this if you've saved any file off in Photoshop ever. Um, it asks if you want to interlace something, and interlacing is a way by, like, usual monitors uh, with bitmap, well, with any, any image, they scan, so they scan in horizontal, <coughs> horizontal lines uh, that are parallel and display the image like that. It's from like old TV um, tubes, used to do stuff like that. But, and this is how interlacing works. So as the browser uh, reads the image, it, if you said you can interlace, it'll do this sort of subsequent pass, and it'll go, duh, 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 this is the next one, beep, 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 beep. And now the image is done. You, you, if, you, if you remember dial-up uh, broadband, uh, not broad, broadband, dial-up, then you will remember this. Uh, yeah, I said better. But yeah. Um, another one is colour tables. Colour tables. So this is your colour table. This is 256 <coughs> colours. So if you save your image up with 256 colours, you've got good fidelity. You've got uh, quite crisp colours. There's loads of a big palette to save from. But some files save the full colour palette by standard. So even if you've got a black and white image, you've got all that information that's, that the, the file wants to reference as a colour table. So it'll say, is this pixel this colour? No, it's black. So we use black. Is this colour? Blah, 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 blah. So what we can do is we can reduce the color, the, uh, the color table for those things use. Now this image, good old Luke Skywalker there, looking handsome. Uh, it's got, that's 256 colors, but if we save that down into uh, an eight bit color, you see you start to lose uh, the fidelity of the image. You know, it's lost a lot of color. His eyes aren't blue anymore, they're sort of beige. So it's not exactly right. I suppose it's a poster, it's nice. Do you prefer that, do you? On the dark side there, right? Well, the better. <laughs> Uh, 
you've got to ask yourself, why is it so complicated? Why have you got all these things? Well, the main reason is they're trying to reduce file size. Um, and a completely uncompressed bitmap image, uh, pretty big. Uh, so this TIFF of Darth Vader's head is 594 kilobytes, which is gigantic. Given that, this isn't its physical size. It's actually a lot smaller than this. So it looks like 100 by 90 or something like that. Um, so on screen, I've zoomed it in so you can see like the, the degradation of the pixels and that. But it's still 594k. BMP, it's got a reduced color, color set. So that's 39k, which is a bit better. JPEG, it's using lossy compression, so we're starting to get artifacts on it. Um, I've only saved this off once, but it's already starting to lose its fidelity. But it's 29K, a bit better. PNG is a lot more uh, modern, so that it, it's much more recent than the rest of them. So that's using reduced colors. It's using what they call predictive compression, which is where, as the file is encoded, it scans across the, the image in a zigzag fashion. And when it hits a, a section of black, it looks at the next pixel and says, is this black? And it says, yes. So we see, well, for this span of pixels, this will be black. And so they can cancel them <coughs> and then they'll stop doing that. So it's a lot more efficient. But still not great. But in 2001, scalable vector graphics became a W3 recommendation. Good. There you go. It was the World Wide Web Consortium uh, with people. Thanks, Phil. So you, Miming along with that. <laughs> I know this one! <laughs> W3C, they're the people that say how things on the web should be built. So, it actually, SVGs have actually been around for two years before 2001, but this was, this was the point at which um, they said, right, this is a thing now. It's like HTML, this is something that you can use, and browser vendors can start building this into their browsers. Because before that, there had been vector graphics, but they'd been in packages like Flash, in which you had to uh, download a plugin like, was it Shockwave? All oh, that sort of badness. And he browsers, oh, Shockwave's out of date, you need to update it, mate. And, ugh, <laughs> awful. But from now on with SVGs, the browsers would start to have some native support for it, which is good. So this is an SVG. This is four kilobytes, so it's exactly the same file size as the, as the PNG. But you can see that it is crisp as anything. And the reason for that is because it's a scalable vector graphic. So it's scalable, you know, and it doesn't use pixels, but I'll get into that in a minute. A more money supermarket example would be this. This is, this is one of our ticks. Um, you'll have seen this if you've used like, any of the, the reset stuff. Um, and this is four kilobytes. And you might say, right, fine, well, PNGs, you know, they're supported and SVGs are complicated and I don't like them. I'm comfortable with PNGs, which is fine. And PNGs are small, but the SVG variant of this is 0.2K. Which is a lot smaller. Which you might say, you know, it's a few K, you know, we've got some images on there, some photographs on the on the heroes there. What was the this one we've seen, Phil? 280 K. 280K. I mean I've seen one that's a meg, right, that's been uncompressed. Uh, so you might say that this is this isn't a problem, but when you start looking into the way that we put icons into our site, we, we tend to use icon sprighting, which is where you define all the different instances of that um, image that you need. <laughs> and then you use the one that you, that you want. But you will load them all at once, so it's one hit on, on your HTTP request. Uh, but it's 12K, and this is just ticks. You know, we've got a lot of icons on the, on the thing, on the site, um, but in it's still 12K. SVG can give you that exact same uh, spriting ability, but at two kilobytes, which is loads better, 84% reduction. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Hmm? You only have to do that maths for you. Well, I didn't do that maths for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the gym actually for all the space you could say. Oh, I see. Let me yeah. just give a warning. <clears throat> so, fidel fidelity. So, this PNG looks okay. Uh, map of the UK. It's 40k, which is pretty big, but we've had to keep it at 40k so that it looks sharp on a browser. Now, with the, the development of uh, retina type displays, uh, it could, it, we could have that graph be twice the size. So the retina display, which has double pixel density, is able to still see a sharp image, uh, and that's fine. Where's, is it this? Oh, sorry. Thanks, mate. Woo! The problem is you can't reuse it anywhere else. If you need to zoom in on it, if you need to you know, make it bigger, if you want to look at a specific county or anything like that, then <coughs> it doesn't no good for you because you're getting all this jagged badness around here. No one likes jagged badness. So there's SVG. 24K, so just on just over half the size. It's sharp, sharp as a pin. Got pins. 
So you might ask, how are SVGs made? Well, SVGs are XML. Um, they're a coding like this. It's a, it's a file type. So here is a valid SVG file, or the, the code within it. Uh, we start with SVG, and we end with SVG. Um, it's got some complicated gubbins here, which is the extensible markup language namespacing thing. I'll be testing you all on this later. Um, but essentially, all this is saying is, is telling the browser what to expect within its boundaries. So, and this gives us nothing at all. We're giving it absolutely no information apart from the fact that you are an SVG. That's it. Um, like bitmaps, SVGs still have a bounding area. So when we say with a, with a bitmap it's 100 pixels wide by 100 pixels high, we do need to do the same with an SVG. An SVG uses viewbox to do that. And here this viewbox is saying the coordinate system, that's what it is, you're plotting points on a, on a, on a map if you like, um, goes from 0 on the X, 0 on the Y, to 100 to 100. So you've got a, a 100 pixel, well not a pixel, 100 point square. Because on light bitmap images, SVG plotting does not use units. If you look back at this, there's no PX on this. And that's one of the reasons that they scale, is because it's, you know, it doesn't use that. Uh, and then this gives us this. It doesn't actually give us this at all, because I've put the border in there, and the border's not on there. But I've had to put a border on them so you can see it's 100 pixels wide. Stop picking holes in it. Uh, then we need to define our shapes. We're going to use uh, our MSM tick uh, as an example. So SVG uses paths and predefined shapes, uh, and these are those shapes, including the path. So path, circle, they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, for this, we can use a polyline, which means that it's a single fragment that defines multiple lines within itself. So we'll put a polyline in. This is our tick, right? Um, you'll see that the, the, the points are grouped together in pairs. So they are they are x and your y coordinates within the view box of 100 by 100 that we've set. So we get this. It's not exactly right, not exactly right. So we've said it's 70 across and 35 down, and then it's then it's that's your first point. Your second point is 41 across and 64 down, that's your bottom point, and then you've got 29 by 52, and that's your top one. So it, it describes that. Now the problem is, polylines and uh, pretty much any shape in SVG will try and self-fill. So it will try and close any gaps so that it can give, deliver a fill for that thing, and that's what this has done here. So we need to stop it doing that. So we add some styles, we're gonna give it a stroke color, so it's on brand, and we're gonna tell it not to fill itself in. And this gives us this, hooray, tick. But it's not right. That's not right, no, no. Never accept that sort of business. So the stroke width is 11, and there's no pixels still. It's 11 of whatever the size the view box is, so it's 11 out of 100. Um, we've given the stroke cap, stroke line joined round so that the top of the the yeah, it's round. You can see it round. Go round. Sorted. But anything inline can do, CSS can do better. We can use CSS within SVGs. So the benefit of this is that if you've got multiple shapes that use a similar type of style, so you've got multiple polylines in there, you can instead of writing it within the polyline declaration itself, you can go into the style and set a style, you can add a class, you can do whatever you want. Um, if any subsequent polylines are added into this SVG file, they will follow the style that's been set in the header there. So they're all going to be have no fill, they're all going to have the blue, uh, the cyan colour, they're all going to be 11, and the line is going to be rounded. Rounded and good. Um, and using CSS for SVG can dramatically reduce file size because you're not having to put that declaration into every single polyline that you've got. Nice and simple. And because we can use CSS, it also allows for interactivity. Whee! Change this colour when you hover on it. How exciting. So there you go. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and this leads us on to interoperability. I said it. So I feel like all the practice I've been going, to bed, bit in it. Which isn't the, isn't the word. Uh, interoperability, which means that anything you can use in an HTML page, you can use in SVG. Uh, so you can use JavaScript, you can use uh, HTML5 tags, you can use CSS. Which is great. So it means that you can make slightly more exciting things like this. Oh, not like that, the right <laughs> click. Stupid right click. Yay! There we go. And that's just using, in there is a simple bit of JavaScript saying when you click that, it does this. Uh, it tracks where your mouse cursor is, you know, 
it's, there's a bugger all to it. Apart from the audio files, which are relatively big because they're audio files, that's six kilobytes, which is pretty small. Pretty good. Uh, I did spend most of yesterday doing that. I should have practiced this more. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, lightsaber. So, use as rest SVG. Um, it's probably easier to say what you wouldn't use SVGs for. Um, photographs is pretty much the only thing you wouldn't use an SVG for um, because they're, they're rubbish. Although, do you remember, this was an album cover, like dance music album covers that were always, you know, an illustrative style. Uh, that worked for this, but actual photographs, not so much. Uh, and that's pretty much it. SVGs are good for icons, logos, illustration, data visual visualization, pretty much anything. Uh, so you may ask, you may ask, how do we get SVGs into our site? Uh, we can use the image tag and just say source tick SVG. Um, you will get limited um, interactivity through this because it will render it like a bitmap image and just plop on your page in its initial state. Um, you can use an object tag where you set the data source to be your SVG and here you have full access to it in the DOM so you can use JavaScript and all that sort of stuff. You can actually use external type JavaScript in that as well. Uh, and you can use them within uh, background images within CSS, so you can just drag them in like that. Uh, again, you go, don't get any interactivity through there, but you do get uh, a much reduced file size, um, and it's loads easier to change an SVG. Uh, so, what has changed since 2001? This has changed since 2001, not just icons. Um, browser support. All our, all our support browser, all our support browsers support SVGs in pretty much all of their ways. There are uh, there's a slight problem in the current iOS Safari uh, that doesn't allow for fragment identifiers. But I haven't told you what they are, so it doesn't mean anything to you. Um, <laughs> so we'll just say, Google we'll just, yeah, just Google it. Uh, so just assume that it all works, um, because it does, on the whole. Um, you don't have to know code. Obviously, this is a relatively intimidating type of thing. So all you need to do is go to your text editor and know where your points are, and then cover it all over CSS, the language you don't know. And if you want to make it shiny, do JavaScript, it's perfectly fine. Um, but you don't need to know code. You can build uh, SVGs within Illustrator. Interestingly, in Illustrator, if you make a shape in Illustrator, you can just do Control A, copy the entire thing, go into a text editor and paste it directly to the text editor, and it exports it as SVG straight, straight from there. You can use an export tool, but won't bother. Um, Sketch, if you're on a Mac, um, exports SVGs. And Inkscape is a free um, vector graphics package, uh, which is rather good. So you should have that if you like it. The end!